In a world where nostalgia rages across the land, where everyone and their mother has a podcast, where there's still a movie trailer guy who says, in a world, three friends revisit films, shows, and games that molded them as they search for answers to life, the universe, and everything in between. Settle in and join us for Screen Refresh. Shiver me timbers, shiver me soul, and welcome back to Screen Refresh, a show where we revisit the films, games, and shows we love growing up and see how they hold up today. I'm your host, Old David, and in this episode I'm joined by real old Nick and dead Dean. Today we'll be setting sail and taking a look at a 1996 high sea adventure, Muppet Treasure Island. The Black Squad. How you guys doing? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. I hit your life, too. Of my- one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty that the whole roll call scene is pretty good yeah just just like someone pitching like hey can we just do gags for like five minutes in the middle of this movie kermit's reaction oh. just huh uh huh he's just slowly <laughs> backpedaling away from the entire crowd <laughs> it's the the realest acting i have ever seen um so have either, either of you have seen this before? What were your first impressions or history with it? I ain't never seen it till today. I think historically I, I like the Muppets shtick. Um, I would say you can't watch this and be mad at it or hate it. Um, there's always going to be parts that are going to bring a smile to your face or make you just flat out laugh. And that's how I felt watching it. I wouldn't say it's like... I mean, it being a kid's movie, when you see it as an adult, some things don't always like... I mean, you got you guys have nostalgia for it. I definitely understand that with my own experiences in movies. Well, um, I wouldn't say I was like totally captivated and enthralled. I did get a lot of enjoyment out of a lot of the movie. And that's really what the Muppets are for. Just yeah, packing in the jokes and the um, happy spirit. This movie used to be on repeat for me as a kid, and this really was. I, I, I well, it is. It is my absolute favorite Muppet movie, and I forgot how much a lot of the songs will get stuck in my head for months on end. And it's weird because it it didn't come out when we were babies, so it's not like you know the Muppet movie or the you know Great Muppet Caper, Muppets Take Manhattan. All of those were either came out just after we were born or way before so yeah this is a this is yeah. a late one in the the muppet like and i think timeline. christmas carol came out in what like 92 and i remember actually seeing that yeah. in theaters and then this one i don't remember in theaters but i had it on vhs and this was after jurassic park this was after me getting into star wars but i think it was three movies that i played on that on that tape player at all times and if it wasn't star wars trilogy if it wasn't Jurassic Park, it was Muppet Treasure Island. Yeah, I mean, this movie for me, I mean, I am a massive, massive Muppet fan. Um, I originally got into them with the Muppet Show. Like, we, for a while at home, had the Disney Channel, and they used to run reruns of the Muppet Show, because the Muppet Show, when that was on, was before I was born, because the Muppet Show was, like, the late 80s, so I would have been, like, a very tiny babier when those when that was that was showing. So I would see reruns of The Muppet Show, and I absolutely loved it. Um, and then, like, I started getting introduced to the movies. And I, I honestly don't remember, like, what order I saw them. Like, I think I think Treasure Island or Christmas Carol were probably one of the first ones I saw, just because they were much more modern. So they were, like, actively running them on the Disney Channel more often than, like, you know, the Muppet movie, the Muppet Caper, and Muppets Take Manhattan. This is this is like, I mean, I, nostalgia plays such a huge role into it. But like, I also just generally love the humor of the Muppets. So like, this is probably one of my favorite movies. I'm surprised oh. <laughs> too with with how old this is. A lot, and this is what's this rated G? Yeah. There's a lot of. Oh no, I think it's PG actually. Sense. The amount of adult jokes, and I don't mean like, you know, like. Uh, gonzo handling a a a cucumber in a sexual way kind of adult joke that would go over the kids heads but the lyrics in some of the songs like they actually say you know i would rather be cutting a throat 
like whoa like holy crap or like i love it when you basically see the guy's toes wiggle as he's being hung like that's fucking insane dark. on how yeah it's dark you don't see that in kids movies anymore and even i think in aladdin they had a line that was very similar to that and they ended up cutting it in the first um the first song in the movie they they changed it from the original theatrical run and then on the re- future re-releases they changed it to a line that's a lot less dark hmm yeah it, it's interesting that the that uh brian henson the director uh and Disney, because this is at the point when Disney had bought uh, Henson's studio. Um, Jim Henson had passed away. This is the second movie the studio had done under Brian Henson rather than Jim. Um, and I was kind of surprised that Brian and Disney decided to go with the Mupp- the uh, Treasure Island script because it is it's a it's a darker story. Like it, you know, it's a swashbuckling like high seas adventure. Like there's sword fighting, you know, guns, a bit of violence to it. Um, I know there were, there was, uh, in some of the interviews I watched for it, they, there was talk that it, the studio was down to either doing this or a King Arthur movie, which, oh God, I wish we got a King Arthur movie. I mean, I love Treasure, I love Treasure, Treasure Island, but like a King Arthur Muppet movie would have also been great. Um, so it was interesting that they, they chose to go to this direction because yeah, there's some, uh, it, it's got some serious things in it. I do like the, they, they were able to dance around character death pretty well. Um, mo- like mm-hmm. obviously, there's one critical death because that's what propels the story forward. But um, I'm pretty sure Captain Arrow, or not Captain, um, oh what uh, Flint? Sam, or... the big blue bird. Yeah, oh, Sam, Sam the Eagle. Eagle. I, yeah, I'm pretty sure his character. I've never read Treasure Island in recent years. I remember reading that book version where one page was always illustrated and the other page had the text and it was like the kid version of adult mm. novels that were classics and i i know i read yeah. that one i never read the original real one but i would almost be certain with the way that that entire thing was scripted and run pretty sure he should have died in the actual book so it's pretty clever on how like oh it's you know test the boat and then he goes away it's true it's like oh man overboard i mean not really he's in a boat but yeah yeah that's a good point they did dance around some of that and like really i mean they can't kill off a no. muppet like that's that's sacrilege um but yeah so muppet treasure island came out in uh 1996 um and actually funnily enough um i didn't plan this or anything but june 2nd is actually the 45th anniversary or june 2nd was i'm not i can't remember exactly when this is going to be coming out um but june 2nd is the 45th anniversary of the original muppet no movie um they're actually doing some theater re-releases of it which is kind of cool like i was just um that explains doing some of my research lot. and like that came up and i was like oh that's <clears throat> had no idea I've been that going was to the thing. theaters a lot and i've been noticing that more and more really good movies are kind of re-releasing not just like star wars and the mummy mm-hmm. because of their noticeable ones but like Studio Ghibli has a marathon. I think it's finished at the time of this recording, and if not, there's only like one or two movies left. Um, that's at Showcase Cinemas, and I'm pretty sure I saw the Muppets as one of the options in the future. But I just thought of it as like, whenever you go to the movies and they have like that trailer for like, check out the cinema classics, and it's always like, The Wizard of Oz or like Casablanca, mm-hmm. and it's like, oh, it's one of those, not something a lot more recent. Geely's getting a re- re-release. I'm looking forward to oh, looking God. forward to that. I st- I still remember the the articles about Geely. Um, it was like Geely rated worst movie of the year, and it's only February. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so uh, Muppet Treasure Island uh, came out in 1996. Uh, this was directed by Brian Henson because um, Jim Henson had passed away. Brian Henson had taken over the studio, and under Brian, they had already done. Um, a Muppet Christmas Carol, which I think is the best version of the Christmas Absolutely. Carol movie, uh, in my opinion. No, it's not opinion; it's fact. <laughs> and this is so. This is the second movie under Brian Henson and under Disney. Um, Muppet Treasure Island famously stars the great, most beloved uh, Tim Curry, who, while his his like big hits are, yeah, there aren't a ton of them. They are huge cult classics i mean from the 1985 clue movie to rock horror picture show legend 
Um, he played it in the original made-for-TV uh, Stephen King It series back in 1990, um, and is one of my like most beloved actors. Also, for a small part he had in Command and Conquer Red <laughs> Alert, um, <laughs> most notably. Which, if you <laughs> if you haven't seen the clip of him defeating capitalism by going to space, uh, you need to pause That's this and go took? up to YouTube. Just get into space. <laughs> When the when the common such, man reaches space, capitalism is destroyed. <laughs> so Tim so Curry, good. Tim Curry is a treasure, has, and one of the best, you know, up there top ten voices in media history. It's true. Oh, absolutely. With, and and I mean, and his career has changed a lot. Like he's done a ton of voice acting work. I think, um, I think one place that at least Nick and I would know him a lot is that he does the voice for Darth Sidious. In um, Clone Wars, uh, is it yeah. Clone Wars? I was I was suddenly spacing if it was Rebels or Clone Wars. I don't know. It, it might have both because the original the original mm. voice actor passed away, and then when he he picked it up for a couple of episodes, and it wasn't. Um, I love him. I felt it was a conver- conver- uh, controversial hire to fill in that gap because it's just his voice is iconic, but so is Palpatine's, yeah. and I felt like it didn't. A credit to that properly but he did a good job for what it was yeah he has one of those voices where you almost cast for the yeah. voice like i'm like thinking Nigel of um, what's it, patrick oh i was thinking of like patrick uh is it warburton yes. yep. yeah yeah who like is another one of those who like was crom or uh, i can't think of the Crunk. character's name and like the emperor's yeah. new groove the poison the poison for Cusco. um Cusco's poison I can't family guy this. all sorts of stuff and you just you just identify him immediately and he's you just love him like he's just great but yeah i think tim curry's another one of those voices so we have tim curry um who's kind of like the big human character in all of this uh playing long john silver we have uh the sadly really underused billy Connolly um from you know notably the boondock saints uh he did voice work in brave he was also in one of the hobbit movies um, and in this, he plays, uh, I actually forgot Billy his last Bones. name, Captain, oh, Billy Bones, uh, Captain Billy Bones, um, kind of brings our, uh, our hero, the, the call to adventure in the beginning. Uh, and he's, oh, he's such a joy in this movie. And I was so sad, um, how he has, I think I was watching an interview with him. I think he said he had, he, he dies in the first nine minutes. Yeah, give or take. <laughs> um but he he was so happy (laughs) yeah he was so happy because he got to he got he has this the claim to fame that is the he is the first ever character to die in a muppet movie oh really wow yeah and he he gets he gets to have that he was like i'm only in it for nine minutes so blink if you miss me but i'm the first character to die in a muppet movie now did he is this a coincidence was he die of like being scared to death heart attack is that pretty much what happened that's what I was thinking. <laughs> it's I, it's kind of ironic that like that he gets marked for death and then dies of natural <laughs> causes. Yeah, because when they bust in later, I'm like, why don't you guys just do this first if you were going to come in here <laughs> regardless? But <laughs> He was so so scared, dies of a heart attack. It's like, boy, you, you don't even need to follow up. Just give people the spot. Like, But uh, yeah. Um, and then... And then our, our hero of the movie is played by Kevin Bishop. Uh, Kevin Bishop's career has kind of ebbed and flowed. Not a lot of really notable things. One kind of fun fact is that um, uh, Kevin Bishop does do the voice acting for Sigvald the Magnificent in Total War. You know, that was the only note is... I had that I wanted to bring up. But I'm glad you caught it. Too. Really? And, uh, and that's a digress quick. I did look it up. He dies immediately. Bone suffers a, s- a second stroke and dies. <laughs> Do they reference the first one? This is the actual. Uh, this is the actual book. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, so I guess. So uh, it's a stroke. Okay. No, is the argument between the two? Really coincidental. Stroke. There's a lot of like leading up to it, but I guess he does suffer a stroke. He's tended by a doctor from with healed with surgical bloodletting. Name is found tattooed there. Doctor saves his life. Tells him to lay off the alcohol, but he does not. As you do, and then he, that's when, like, and it plays out exactly like the book. You know, Pew reaches the inn, Bones is terrified. He slips in the black spot, and then he leaves, and then he suffers a second stroke and dies. Oh wow! Oh, just they just. 
I mean, it's much longer, <laughs> it sounds like, but like it plays out exactly the same. It's like he, instead of having a stroke, seeing a doctor, doing all that, they were just like, he has a stroke, oh no, I'm fine, and then dies immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so I thought that was a fun fact about Kevin Bishop. Um, also, a, a really kind of funny thing about Kevin Bishop is that he he got the part um, to play Jim in this movie. Um, but unfortunately, between the time of him getting the part and actually starting filming, his voice started to change. That makes sense. And started, and like his voice, he would just have like voice cracks all the time. So they actually had to dub his singing with someone else you know um, because he just his voice couldn't that, couldn't do it and he kept like cracking that kind of tracks with me because even as a kid i never liked his singing bits i never yeah. liked the this his first song um somewhere out mm-hmm. there i think that's what it was and then like the later on when he does that duet i i didn't care too much i mean it was it was okay but it, the first song when they're like singing in the end i never liked it and just something even as a kid i knew like something's not right with his voice because especially with later yeah. on with tim curry he he is a presence on screen and you know that's his voice mm-hmm. absolutely and all the muppets if they're muppets you know it's them singing and if not it's close enough that you can't tell yeah so that was that was kind of sad but like and it's true like the, the songs um that kevin bishop has they they seem like this really like airy falsetto that just doesn't seem to fit the character i don't know it the, the dubbing didn't turn out great i thought unfortunately yeah. but i mean what are you gonna do when you when you hire a, an actor who's like 13 14 years old i mean look at this? like like in like the, the it movies that came out um the stranger things kid was in it finn wolfhard i think his name is and you can mm-hmm. see the age gap between the first movie and the second movie and you had to digitally de-age him because he already he hit puberty and he hit it hard oh i didn't realize they had yeah, they did that they had to de-age him a little i think they de-aged all of them but they i mean did, when you, yeah. when you it, look at like season weird. one of um stranger things and then you watch like ghostbusters it's almost filmed like one or two years apart and he looks like he's you know what's that I, it's just like that skit from uh family guy where it's like hey guys you want to go play baseball never mind i'm gonna go home and masturbate <laughs> and that's kind of what like the kid did because it was just he went from like little kid like hey look at my little yoda figurine and look i have a millennium falcon to like we we'll to go on a date <laughs> they just need the lord of the rings and just film it all at once yeah just all the way through it's like how many seasons do you think we'll get i don't know let's record seven all well. right i mean that makes sense i mean he he seemed young back then but at least it was filmed quick mm. enough that he didn't look like he aged but the voices are always tough because i know um terminator 2 the same thing happened the kid that played john connor uh his voice deepened over the course of the the movie and they had to redub his lines from the beginning because just it didn't match how he sounded toward the end of the movie. Yeah, that's tough, especially with like singing mm-hmm. parts. And I mean, they 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 did a good job for what it's worth. But yeah, his his songs did suffer because yeah. of it. Um, for the the Muppet cast, I always love how these movies do it, where it's like Kermit the Frog as Captain yep. Smollett. Like we don't get we don't get the actor. We just get what is the Muppet playing. Um, and it's, it's like so hard to, to like parse out, like when you look up the actual information, it's like, you never find the character's name. It's always like, oh, Frank Oz as Kermit. Yeah. It's like, okay, but what did, what was Kermit in this movie? <laughs> so it's like, you have, it's like you're playing six degrees of separation. So you have Kermit the Frog playing Captain Smollett, uh, Miss Piggy as Benjamina Gunn, which all I can think of is like, is she married to Sean Gunn? <laughs> um, uh, we have Fozzie the Bear as Squire Tr- uh, Trelawney, and Sam the Eagle uh, as Mr. Arrow. And this is actually Sam the Eagle's first major movie role in one of the huh. Muppet movies. Uh, before this, he was he ma- he played like cameo parts and was just on the show. So this was like a big up for Sam the Eagle. So that was cool to see. Uh, he is always a fun one. Um. So yeah, so one other thing actually is oh I did forget to mention. And then in this we also have Gonzo I was about and to Rizzo. Say, you're going to drop off the two most important of, characters in this. I know who who are kind of basically the main characters and they they play themselves. 
um, which was kind of an interesting choice. They just kind of threw them in there as like, hey, they're main characters, but like they're not in the story. Um, I know originally the thought was of the studios that they were going to split split the Jim Hawkins character into two roles, and it was going to be Jim and Hawkins, and that was going to be Gonzo and Rizzo. <laughs> But they decided to, like, cast a human actor because they wanted to keep, like, the narrative of, like, this coming-of-age adventure story. Which, like, I get. And, you know, I think Gonzo and Rizzo still do a good job of, like, propelling the Muppet comedy side of, like, the main core group. They've always... No, they've always been my favorite. And every... You know, it's just like Key and Peele, Keenan and Kel, Gonzo and Rizzo. You know, they're they're up there as one of the greatest comedy duos. And it's unfortunate with all the... Um, the fallout that um, the main actor mm. had. What's his name? Uh, um, I have it in my notes here as I stall for time. Yeah, I I, re- I I remember most recently they there was a Muppet special for the Haunted yeah. Mansion, and it was led by Gonzo and Pepe the Prawn. And I was like, that's really strange. Like it should be Gonzo and Rizzo. Like that's the duo. Like I mean, Pepe is great. Don't get me wrong. Oh, Pepe. But it was just really strange, and like that's when I started. I was like looking up. I was like, "Oh, where's Rizzo?" And that's when I found. I saw the fallout yeah. of the actor, and I was like, "Oh, that's that kind of sucks." Like Rizzo was a really fun character that played off of Gonzo really Steve well. Steve Whitmire. But, there was a big fallout between him and Disney after the buyout, and um, it didn't end well. And he was pretty much fired. He wasn't only Rizzo. He also did a lot of other major characters in the Muppets. Like he he was the voice mm-hmm. of Kermit for a very long time too, and. Um, you know, was, he was devastated, which I can imagine, but studio just didn't yeah. want to have it. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that's one big reason, too, why we haven't seen the Muppets nearly as much as we used to. But I don't know. It's too bad, but I hope they figure out a way to bring Rizzo back because he was always a childhood favorite. Oh, yeah. He's a great character. And, like, Pepe worked as a fill-in for a bit, but uh, I love seeing Gonzo and Rizzo mm-hmm. together. It's just it's a great pairing. So without further ado, I think we can get to the movie. You guys ready? Give me 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, give me 90 minutes. I, just give me 90 minutes. Just, 90 go, minutes. just go slow. Give Approximately or, just give one, take. one second is one real second. So just... So, the movie opens with a sea shant. You know. Actually, I, I do miss the classic Disney logo. I won't lie. I got so excited Mm -hmm. to watch this, seeing the classic just blue and white Disney, the thing pans down, whatever, like, you know, it fades in, and then it has that classic just Disney opening theme to it. Like, I felt like I was a kid again. Ends with that, like, synthy whistle. Mm Mm-hmm. I half expected them to have cut it out and just replaced it with the Disney Plus logo. Honestly, yeah, me too. (laughs) Although, oh, God, the ads. It's so jarring. Yeah. What do you mean? Although, I mean... You guys might yeah, not we don't have ads, it. but I don't pay for a Disney <laughs> without ads. <laughs> Peasant. <laughs> Just refuse. Uh, it was so jarring. I go to start my movie, and I'm seeing something about State Farm Insurance, and I'm like, what is this? So the movie starts with a, she- a sea shanty, the only way it should. And actually, a shanty. really good The one. soundtrack has no right to go as hard as it does in this entire movie. I mean, it's. I mean, I didn't mention it before, but like... Hans Zimmer on yeah. the soundtrack is just absolutely killing it. And like in the behind the scenes featurette they have, like he talks about the fact that like he he did the, he wrote the soundtrack and he wanted to be dead serious with it cuz he was saying that like the muppets bring the humor and it only amplifies their humor if you go straight on well, everything else. It's like that else. that meme of, you know, the two best performing actors in any muppet movie have been Michael Caine and Tim Curry. And the reason why Michael Caine was so good was because he didn't play it, the role, like as if he was doing like the next big Oscar thing or like some Shakespearean play. He played this like stone cold, like he is acting amongst other people of his quality and caliber. He treated all the Muppets like they were humans. Whereas Tim Curry, he treated all the Muppets because like he, he just, it, I butchered the joke. Whereas he himself thought he was a Muppet. So that's why he blended in so mm-hmm. well. And I love... I, it, there's such a magic to the performances in Muppet movies because of the interaction between the puppeteers and the human actors. And it's... 
it's so cool because you know as you dive into a bit of like the the how the the puppeteers go about their jobs and like their mentality like they have this whole like communal rule among the puppeteers that if a puppet is on your arm you only speak as if you are that character so like tim curry was even saying that it's like it's really funny like i would ask someone a question and if it was like miss piggy like miss piggy would answer the question so like miss piggy was the actor not not whoever was puppeteering it so like if he was like going through lines or had like questions like he was talking to whoever the muppet was it's interesting thinking knowing now especially like that's frank oz that's yoda and then just hearing him later on doing the typical piggy like Hi-ya! and just screaming on the top of his <laughs> lungs pretending to be a female pig and doing karate chop noises and and just knowing who is behind the mask so to speak and it's just so funny to think that even watching like when the all the elmo stuff that went viral last summer you know like the you know onions garlic celery balsamic vinegar like that's the whole mm. knowing that's how they would perform it and that actually makes so much more sense seeing all those other performances from different muppeteers that i'm just gonna behave like i'm i it's, i'm elmo i'm not i'm not you know kevin clash i'm not uh, frank guys i'm i'm the person that i'm holding on my current hand right now and that's that's cool yeah i think that's something that jim henson might have started in like how he he taught his puppeteers um because it does it creates that really immersive uh environment on this on the studio mm-hmm. and on the set and I think that only amplifies like how well they interact with each other and how the actors treat the Muppets when they're filming, which is such a cool concept. I mean, it's it's very much like um, I'm trying to think. There's a, a name for that acting style where like the person stays in character for the entirety of, method, of filming. Method. method. Thank you. So it's it's almost like a, a method puppeteering, is that you just are that character. I'm sure, it helps too to stay which in, is in that mindset. So yeah, so we get our sea shanty, uh, which is over the main credits, which is what we, we get to see those great credits with like Miss Piggy as and Cumber the Frog as, which I, I always get a kick out of. Um, and the kind of motion going on in the background under the credits is kind of like our intro to the story. We're kind of seeing what has led up to everything, um, which is the, the story of how the treasure got lost to begin with, the, the treasure of, of Captain Flint's treasure. Um, where like we see him and his crew coming onto shore, burying the treasure, and then Flint betraying them all and shooting them, which has got to be hard with single shot flintlock pistols shooting fifteen people. Can you I don't all know how he did it. stand in a line? <laughs> all right, next group. Wait, wait, wait. The the in they everyone remembers him for his treasure. They should have re- remembered him for his pistol ingenuity. <laughs> He's just got like fifteen just, pistols I on was his just back. Say they're <laughs> hanging on his back. <laughs> well, that's uh, oh, what is that called? There's uh, there's a term for that. Oh, it's killing me. Method act. Where like it was almost like <laughs> a, uh, it was like you no, know, it was like a gauntlet you would have that had multiple pistols on it. Interesting. Oh, what is it? The power glove. The power glove. <laughs> oh, it's bugging me. The shooty gauntlet. <laughs> the shooty gauntlet. I mean, I hate the fact that the only reason I, I know about it is because of Warhammer. And they would say, like, oh, this guy is armed with a flintlock blank. And I'd be like, what is that? And I looked it up, and it's like, oh, it's like multiple flintlock pistols, like, attached together. Huh. Yeah, right so in, we're, we're getting... Tell us what that's got. Get in the comments. <laughs> so we're getting that introduction, uh, and it kind of starts to fade out as we see... Uh, Flint has killed his crew and he's walking back to his ship himself and we're introduced to kind of like our opening narrator uh, which is Captain Billy Bones Uh, and Billy Bones is kind of now filling in the gap of what we we saw and he's telling this to a group of tavern goers who are incredibly lethargic about (laughs) about the story and regard Billy as a drunkard because he's told the story 60 times 50 times I forget what they actually say uh, and he is, in fact, a drunkard, and he is drunk in this moment. Every time I, I, I don't see Billy Colin Connolly often, but in my developing years, like I mentioned, I watched this movie a thousand times, 
So the first time I saw Boondock Saints was the first time I think I'd seen him in anything else outside of this. So then just seeing him in Boondock Saints, like, hey, that's that's Billy Bones. <laughs> it's funny because like when I saw him this, and I'm like, oh, it's Billy Conley. I'm like, that's awesome. I love him from... And then I just kind of trailed off because I was like, I have no yep. idea. It's this. But I, I know him so well, and I love his acting. Um, I do remember when I, when uh, I mean, hot take, I liked the Hobbit films. Um, and when he appears in the Hobbit, the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the War of the Five Armies, I was so stoked to see him. Um, but yeah, I, I just like him. I just don't know from what exactly. It's probably the accent. He does have a. I mean, that could it's be a nice accent. To, I don't know. There's some actors that just when they come on screen, you immediately mm-hmm. are just. I'm gonna pay attention to you. There's no specific reason. It's just they're, they're captivating, and he just has that, you know, that riz. Yeah, I mean, to be funny, not to be funny. Uh, it was funny, like watching this when he came on screen, and started talking. I was just immediately reminded of my uncle for some reason, who's Scottish. And I was just like, oh, he sounds just like my uncle. I was like, oh, maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's where this fondness is. It could be. <laughs> uncle Billy. Um, so, oh, was that right? Uncle Billy. Uncle Billy. Uncle Billy Bones. Uncle Baby Billy. I wish Billy. his last name was Bones. That'd be so cool. Uh, so we're in the tavern, and we're introduced to our quote-unquote heroes. Uh, and they all work at this, this tavern slash inn uh, where Billy is getting drunk and just telling these stories about treasure. Um, we have Jim Hawkins, the, the bright-eyed wannabe hero, um, Gonzo, and Rizzo. Uh, and all three of them work at the inn. Um, but they're also Are they more like indentured kind of the adopted servants? children. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, was like, I wasn't sure. I was like, Are, did she adopt them? Are they indentured servants? I don't think they'd leave the inn. <laughs> it didn't sound like it, especially since um, Mrs. Uh, Bulveridge, who runs the inn, it also feeds them. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, table scraps. Yeah, not not great. Uh, it's not a great life for the three of them. And I think, yeah, I don't. I know we know that Jim Hawkins is an orphan because he says so, and his dad was um, a first mate on a ship. Who I love how he has this loving concept of his father, where he's like, "Oh, my dad, he was first mate. He ran off as soon as he could to go live life on sea." And I'm like. Dude, you're an orphan because he abandoned you. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, Jim, reel in, reel in your expectations, bud. Um, but yeah, so they, they work and I think live at the inn. I th- It's never cleared up with Gonzo and Rizzo if they're also orphans, but they're, they just all live at the inn and they eat table scraps. And life is pretty awful. And we get a brief glimpse of kind of their awful lifestyle with Miss Bulveridge who can hear everything that happens in the inn. How does um, she bloody do that? <laughs> just the tiniest thing happens and she just yells out at them. Uh, usually a pretty good quip about dishes or putting out the lights or not giving Billy any more any more rum. <laughs> um, so we get an idea of like their current life and why this call to adventure is going to be so good to them. So they're closing up the, we see them closing up the tavern and like putting out the lights and everything's really hard. And and suddenly Billy Bones just comes barreling in from his room demanding rum. Give me rum. rum. I need <laughs> rum, lads. We got the shakes. And what does he say? He's got, no, I could, like the tatters. No, it's like, give, give me rum until I like pass out or something. <laughs> rum. Um, in what can only probably be the inspiration for Jack Sparrow. When he was given the black spot, this is the scene that I thought of every single time. So Billy comes in, he's demanding rum. We hear from the background Miss Bulveridge yelling, Don't give him any bloody rum. And she they all three, all four, and think, How does she bloody do that? Just such a great little callback story, uh, joke that they keep running with. Um, but something seems wrong, and immediately we get this really spooky moment. Where, like, everything goes quiet and dark, and we just hear, like, the tapping of a cane on cobblestone. And we get this little, like, this, like, horror pan in on the door. Which a lot is, of canted I mean, angles in this movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, like, I imagine it's, like, inspiration from when they did Christmas Carol. Where, like, they had some of those, like, spooky elements, and, like, they wanted to bring that in when they're doing this. Um so we hear this kind of cane walking in, and suddenly there's a knock on the door. 
uh, and it slams open, and we are introduced to Blind Pierre, which is a former shipmate of Billy Bones. And Blind Pierre has been hunting Billy down because they think that he has the map to Flint's treasure. What do I think his name uh, is Blind Pew? It is. Is it Pew? I thought it was Pierre. Oh, Pew. it's Pew. He says it with an accent, but... Oh. Yeah. Oh, my fault. P-E-W. Like, uh, pew, pew, pew. It, it was one of those things where it's like, how can I find the name of this character? It's like, he was played by this puppeteer. And I'm like, yeah, but who was he? <laughs> <laughs> and so he's been hunting Billy down, and he comes to deliver Billy the black spot um, after having a little gag of him being blind and trying to find him, which... It plays, like, really funny at first, but then you have the moment where, like, Billy cocks back the, um... The pistol. The hammer. His pistol. Yeah. Yeah, and all of a sudden, he hears it and just, like, rushes over in a very, um... Uh, what was that movie? Don't Breathe? <laughs> with the... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> home invasion with the blind yeah. guy. It's very much a Don't Breathe moment. Uh, and so... And, and what is it? It's blind what? P-E-W. Oh, Blind Pew. Pew. Oh. So Blind Pew delivers the black spot, which is literally just a piece of paper with a drawn black spot on it, uh, and gives it to Billy, who freaks out because he knows that he's now marked for death. So Billy runs upstairs and he starts packing his bags, and Gonzo and Rizzo are helping him in a comedic way, like, oh, I got your underwear, oh, I got your socks. <laughs> um, so <they're> <laughs> we're going to help. They're just like, yeah, we're going to help. <laughs> yeah, we're going to grab things one at a time, put it in this bag. Um, so Billy's packing, he's like, oh, I've got to get out, and he's freaking out, and then all of a sudden, he just immediately dies. <laughs> <laughs> or we think he dies. He passes out, which I guess is the first stroke. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, maybe that's their and they're way like, of oh my god. that. Yeah, it's like, oh my god, he's dead. And then he's like, oh, wait, uh, uh, Jimmy, Jim, Jimmy, Jim, 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 Jimmy. Uh, he's Jimmy, Jim, Jimmy, Jim, 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 Jimmy. <laughs> and, I, and I joke that I have for... I mean, we're old enough now. Decades done to Tim. Uh, <laughs> Tim, 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 Tim. Which, which even came to the form at uh, Tim's bachelor party. We had made a bunch of temporary tattoos, some of which of Tim's face, others of which were Timmy, Tim, Timmy, Tim, 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 Timmy. Um, <laughs> oh, wow. I just realized that. Mm-hmm. That's that where that came here. from. Because I used to say it like all the time yep. to him when we were in like high school. Was a reference to that joke. It's full so full circle now, Full Dean. circle. I could have two strokes so, now and die happy. After finding which Jim is actually <laughs> Jim, Jim, Jimmy, Jim, Jimmy, um, Billy Bones reveals that he does in fact have the treasure map to Flint's treasure uh, and gives it to Jim, thinking that he'll go on his the high seas adventure that he always wanted to. Uh, so gets the map and then Billy Bones finally dies, for real this time. But this He's is a kids dead. movie. <laughs> I like that meta joke. Yeah, yeah in as uh, uh, not as Billy Connolly said, the first Muppet movie death, which he's very proud to have. Uh, and then they all freak out as they realize that they are in the room with a dead man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fitting. Uh, and as they're running out of the room, suddenly the inn is besieged by uh, Billy's old crew, who I imagine were coming to kill him, hence the black spot, but Billy's already dead. Uh, so they just end up basically setting fire to the tavern uh, as Jim Gonzo and Rizzo harrowingly escape the inn from the besieged pirates. I do like how um, Miss um, the the innkeeper she uh, oh yeah she's Bullridge. yeah she's super hard on them and she's not very it, it's very much like a master slave driver kind of thing and mm-hmm. you know and then when she realizes what's going on like completely selfless without thinking like take the stairs in the back and get out of here. I got this. And it was really nice to see her do that kind of thing. Oh yeah. And then she starts fighting off pirates. Yep. They should have woke and her doing up first. It like, doing, like, doing it like hook style with the, like the kid who just like bowling balled down a, a, a gang plane. <laughs> thud butt. Thud butt. <laughs> I'm amazed you remember that kid's name. Oh, we had a big thing about it on one of our other episodes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Jim... Rizzo and Gonzo uh, make their way to London to go hire a ship, um, which is amazing to me that the three of them, having no experience whatsoever, they're just like, we'll go to London, we'll get a ship. It'll be great. There, there mm-hmm. was, I forget if it's before the fire or after f- the fire. I think it's before all the craziness. But he's, Jim's just like, this is like my favorite line in the movie. I don't know why, but um, Jim's like, 
I hate my life. And Gonzo's like, I hate your life too. And then Rizzo's like, if I had a life, I'd hate it. <laughs> I don't it's know that... why that just is like, just that became my favorite quote in the movie. I don't know. It's that Muppet charm. Just they have so many just like self depreciating jokes that it just hits right. Maybe that's why millennials are so like, all right, time to go jump in the fire. And you know, and just this is fine. <laughs> and it's just maybe it's because we've been growing up with that kind of humor for so long. And it's, I don't know, it just hits. It's true. That self deprecating humor. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, the Muppets is just full of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so Jim and his friends, they make their way to London, hire a ship, and they head to. I mean, it looks like it's an, an apartment, so it's probably like a in the city apartment of someone who owns a, an estate, looking for like a super wealthy shipwright to uh, lease a ship from. Uh, unfortunately, the person they're looking for is away and won't be back until made up holiday. The I'm, I'm sure. Lulu. <laughs> <laughs> and like I saw that, and I'm like, this is this is not a real thing. This is a Muppet holiday they made up. You know, honestly, I I have no idea because I know it's fake. But because it's Muppets, it's like 50-50. It could actually be mm. a real holiday, and it's just that, or he's just laughing because he's just spouting out nonsense. Because it is kind of, you got three, you know, tattered homeless people covered in soot asking, hey, can we borrow a ship? Of course that's going to go so well. <laughs> I do love that, like, as a period piece, this is not how this interaction would go. <laughs> It would not be, hey, you homeless scrubby kids, you want a boat? Uh, let me give you my time. Oh, but also, if you really want a boat, the the shipwright's dim-witted son is still here and is very wealthy. <laughs> so maybe you should talk to him. <laughs> um, so they do they do get in because the the shipwright's half-wit son, uh, played by Fozzie Bear, um, is inside and is willing to listen to their tale about the the treasure map uh the treasure map that fozzy is immediately convinced is real and why does he believe it's real because the man who lives in his finger (laughs) said so mr bimbo and i love the mr bimbo jokes it's funny because frank oz famously hated it and thought it was dumb (laughs) that's why it's so good (laughs) (laughs) he's like this is a stupid joke no one is going to think this is funny. And they, how, they kept it anyway. How wrong he was. Because he's like, I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense. Because <laughs> even as a kid, we're watching this like, this guy's an idiot. Oh, yeah. It's <laughs> it's like the perfect, like, all right, his half wit some. He's kind of dumb. Oh, no, he's real dumb. <laughs> he's been to the moon twice. <laughs> <laughs> So Fozzie, believing that the treasure map is real, decides to, to finance the voyage for them uh, in the quickest turnaround ever of hiring and staffing <laughs> and prepping a boat. They basically leave <laughs> the door the and boat. there is He's the boat. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so we get to the boat. They're kind of packing everything on. Jim and, the, and um, Gonzo and Rizzo are super excited to be on the boat, going on an adventure super excited and we are introduced to the captain of the vessel in classic muppet fashion of overblowing an introduction of a character misdirection where yeah where they have they have sam the eagle the first mate you know kind of giving orders and talking about oh you're the captain he's the the most ruthless man you'll ever meet you know he shot a man for looking at him wrong um and we have this whole misdirection scene where you see this kind of tough old gentleman getting out of a, a, a coach and you're like oh it's gonna be like a like a michael kane kind of situation where you have like a, a scrooge like a tough uh older actor and then he he moves aside and there's kermit standing there hey, you really? and he looks very cute in his little captain outfit <laughs> um and sam the eagle is kind of over hyping kermit like the whole beginning where Kermit's like, all right, you know, like, let's get the ship going and underway. And Sam the Eagle's like, you know, get that line or he'll shoot you dead. Yeah. And it's like, nope, nope. I did not. Let's just get the sail up. I did not say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm paraphrasing for you, sir. I like how he's that, he gives that vibe of like 
the kid telling the teacher they didn't assign homework for the weekend kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Uh, yeah, Sam's great in this, and like his character is like always plays so hard edge and so serious. Um, so on board, so we're on the ship, uh, the Hispaniola. Uh, which a really cool thing about this ship is that they actually constructed a full size sailing vessel in huh. the studio, and they had it, they had it mounted on a uh, a rigging that was all uh, motorized. Oh, so like a gimbal, like a so it actually of, looked like it was like yeah. So water. it would so like while they're on the full size boat, it would actually like tilt and like go back and forth. And actually, Brian Henson was so worried that people would get seasick, they actually handed out. Uh, seasickness pills for people huh, that's interesting yeah it's like when if you ever had a chance to like uh like watch the behind the scenes videos and stuff seeing the boat it's like so cool like how they have it like propped up and they have it like turning and hauling like it's really cool and thinking back too i mean it it almost seems like why would you want to do that for something so expensive but they're on the ship for yeah, yeah it's a massive it's a set piece for most of yeah, the movie for sure and like i mean I don't necessarily think you notice it, like the motion of the boat, but like... I mean, you see it like... Maybe that's part of it. There's lights. I mean, I'm looking at it right now. There's lighting coming in from outside. Oh, maybe... Well, this is on... They didn't They didn't shoot the interior. The interiors are a different set, I assume, then. I don't know. There's one shot that made me I'm not sure. Because when... I think it's when um, Tim Curry comes in to like you know grant uh like to drink on behalf of like a successful voyage and you know like break the ice with the captain kind of thing and he rolls in the cart with the brandy when they open the door it's clear as day that yes it's supposed to be bright outside and you know like blue sky but the blue is not blue sky it's a blue screen and they just never did Mm -hmm. anything with it and i never noticed that until now so i think the interiors might actually be a part of the ship well, I guess yeah. Well, I mean, maybe the captain's quarters at least, because yeah. that's like a top. Oh, but the interior, like the below deck, yeah, that's I don't know, that's fifty fifty. Because I'd imagine I mean, they, probably not. The rack- cameras, the camera work in there would be hard. Less camera now work that than I'm, just the puppeteers. What's that? Now team? that I'm looking mm. at the scene with when Tim Curry is introduced next, um, like there's light streaming through the windows. There's things hanging from the ceiling, and they're all swaying, and the light is moving, like the boat is rocking. So oh. I don't. Huh. They either just did a really good job with something, or the set is actually still moving or on something, because everything is shaking like the boat is moving. Well, it's harder because so, I, I know, know, like when they did, I hate bringing this back to Star Wars, but this actually is relevant. When they shot The Empire Strikes Back and they did the whole swamp with um, Yoda, the the whole set was built like four or five feet up to accommodate for Frank Oz being below so that he can puppeteer mm. Yoda properly. So I'm wondering if when they shot all of the scenes on the top deck, I don't know anything about boats. So if I screw up terminology, David, I know you know, but correct me if I'm wrong. But <laughs> on the top deck, I don't know how they would have had the puppeteers because usually there's some kind of like exposed floor where they're able to mm. do their thing and then they got the arm up and then like they're doing the puppeting and then everyone else around them is you know at normal floor height and everything so that they're able to still be um you know eye level or at least the right correct height for the muppet so i i don't know that is a good question i might have to go and watch those videos again uh of the full size ship because it looked at least from like the stills in some of the limited footage of it that it was like a solid piece like there weren't like cutouts in the hull or anything because the other option would just be that it, they're just laying down on the ship and the camera i mean, I I mean the camera too. never looks down at people's feet so and if there are it's you never see the you know the muppets obviously they're controlling it from the top down but um yeah you never kind of see <clears> that so it's kind of like a rob lightfield comic it could be like <laughs> that like it's true like they never you never see below the waist of a muppet yeah so you don't I mean, most of them don't have legs. So and all the, it's always like a, a marvel of special effects. Whenever you do see the entire mm-hmm. Muppet without any um, strings attached, literally, and it's like like when when, when Kermit was like riding the bike in Central Park. Oh, that's like a famous yeah. like that was like a, a a marvel of engineering at the time. Yeah. So something like that. Whenever you see the full body of the Muppet, it's usually because there's something else that they're able to do to make it do that. But it's never them just standing and walking around. Yeah. 
that would be weird to see. <laughs> it was just, it was just these Muppets just walking and you're seeing their feet and legs move. It's like, oh, that's disconcerting. Uh, so on board the ship, the Hispaniola, uh, we are introduced to the full ragtag crew in this kind of five minute sequence of, of listing off names. Uh, Kermit and Sam the Eagle, the first mate, are going through the whole band of crew, including one of my favorite gags, which was the, the, the roll call for old Tom, real old Tom. And then Dead Tom. And Dead Tom, who was actually just a skeleton that one of the crewmates was holding up and said, like, hey. Um, but it is this roll call of progressively getting worse and worse and worse. And you can just see it. I mean, he's a Muppet, but like you can see it on Kermit's face that he's slowly becoming more and more distressed about what he is seeing. Uh-huh. Uh, it's like, yeah. huh. a little shake. Then they have uh i can't remember his name but they have the headless pirate uh the crewman sorry um we have uh, what was it um uh angel face who was just this gross looking muppet we had the the gag of the uh the female crew member who was like uh bug eating o'brien or yeah. some really long name about how gross they were and it's just like and here's this just attractive woman. It's like, oh, right. oh with right. like a deep, <laughs> with like a man, yeah, with, with like a, a man's voice. overdub voice. A very, a very like mid '90s joke. <laughs> um, and so we kind of, we kind of get a general idea for the crew. And Kermit's getting really, really nervous about this whole thing, and calls the officers immediately into his cabin, where he freaked out about who hired the crew. <laughs> and that's when we learn that we have the second gag of I can't remember his name. What is what is the name again for it? Who? Who's the name? The man living in Fozzie's finger. Oh, Mr. Pimbo. Oh, Mr. Mr. Bimbo. Oh, right. And it's like Mr. Because they do this whole pointing thing where it's like, who hired this crew? And everyone's pointing closer <laughs> and closer to Fozzie. And then Fozzie points to his finger. And everyone's just like, what? It's like, Mr. Bimbo hired the crew. <laughs> oh, the it's suggestion like, like from the, man. the chef, Long John Silver. Yeah. It's like, oh, Long John hired the crew. Like, oh. All right, Mr. Bimbo. You You have doomed us all um and so after we have this meeting uh jim and the team are a little wary of long john silver because of the vague warning uh that billy bones had given them about beware the one-legged man uh and long john has one leg which is really just kind of like not being nice to people with disabilities being like he has one leg he's bad but <laughs> the 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 reveal That's though how i live my life the, the reveal, though, is when they go down to the galley and they meet him for the first time, one minor digression, he's singing Drunken Sailor to himself as he's like peeling potatoes or something. Mm. As a kid, before the internet and, and, and Shazam and all the other means of just, oh, just have the phone held up to record whatever his music is playing and it'll tell you what it is. It took me 15 years. No, maybe not 15, but at least like. 11 12 years to find out that that is an actual sea shanty yeah and i didn't know that this Uh -uh. was just i didn't i thought it was just made for the this movie and i thought it was just a Mm. muppet thing and i didn't know it was the real thing until i was like 17 18 and i heard somebody singing like what would you do with a drunken sailor like whoa 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 what are you singing and i thought they were just muppet fans too and then i realized like oh this is a real song uh so another funny story i knew this song really well because my grandfather used to sing it to me when I was a small child and was like his song of choice. So like when I heard him singing, what do you do with drunken sailor? I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. I don't know why my grandfather was so into sea shanties. I mean, we, we sailed a lot growing up, but like, I mean, that doesn't go hand in hand necessarily. Shit, I should have asked you. You knew the whole time. I knew the whole time. You could have said it. I'd be like, I'll sing the whole song for you. Like, Your grandfather looked a lot like Tim Curry. <laughs> But during the but during this meeting, they are very. Um, he's very personable. He's very likable. Oh, he's so likable. He is the most likable. He's like, have some apples, have some free food, go nuts. Like it's it's very easy to see why people like him. And then he stands up, and then that's when it's like, <gasps> he has one leg, Jim. It's like, all right. Cool. A lot a lot of people really? only have one leg. Thanks. We for were being warned about the result. one-legged man. Yeah. And apparently he was originally supposed to have like a peg leg prosthetic, but it it just didn't work for Tim Curry. Apparently he thought it was way too uncomfortable, so they switched to a crutch. Good for him. That it I think that was a, a good decision. 
Yeah. I mean, I don't think it would have really changed much thematically or like in the narrative. Like we still get it. Yeah. Um, and plus he has that, like if, that, that joke or not joke, but like he tricks him later on with like, had me my oh, stretch yeah, lab. with the cane. Yeah. Um, I wonder if they, yeah, I wonder so if they, they tied his leg that. up, like tied his foot to his thigh or something. Know, maybe. Yeah. And his pants are baggy could, enough that he can do well with hiding it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can see that being a car. I mean, a good friend actor, like speaking up about that kind of thing. Yeah. I know that's that's probably hard. Like I always hear stories about like the Marvel actors talking about how horrible some of their costumes are. So like, good to see. Oh yeah, I bet. But yeah. So Long John, super nice guy, the most friendly. Everybody loves him. Uh, so yeah. So he he pretty easily wins over the trio. Like he is going to be everyone's best friend. Um, so we're doing some ship stuff. We get introduced. Uh, you know, we're at the sailing voyage. It's kind of a little glossed over. We get like a little bit of tension with like they lose wind at one point, and we have the great um, cabin fever I've number. Got cabin fever. I've got <laughs> it too. Uh, which is, I think, one of the better songs in the movie. I it's so funny. I'm I'm so wishy washy on songs in movies sometimes, but like most of the songs in the Muppets, I'm pretty good on. I mean, I didn't love Jim Hawkins ones so much but like most of the songs they, they hit pretty well the first song I just, and definitely yeah um, oh or is that what you mean sorry uh, th- wait is that the, what it's called it's no like, heave hoes when they leave port um yeah heave hoes oh, the yeah, second no. song of the film no i didn't like that one much no the very very first one when it's like shiva the, uh, my the timbers, credits. Shiva oh my. yeah yeah i love that one. Oh, it's so good and um professional pirate is still Absolutely, mm. one of my top favorite musical songs that I've ever heard. And it's like people are like, "Oh, Phantom of the Opera," and you know, stuff from Wicked, and like, no, man, it's Muppet Treasure Island. Uh, but so we have the Cabin Fever. I like how uh, Cabin song, which, cabin which is oh, which is oh, which is just so fun because like the whole ship becomes like a disco, and they have like the lights <laughs> shooting off into the air, and like it's just like this huge party, and this is like. I mean, there's a whole there's a whole really funny subplot going on in the movie, which is Rizzo has sold tickets to other rats to go onto the boat as a cruise like vacation. I love that. Tour, so, like, this a is, tour of the Caribbean. <laughs> yeah, this is like a big scene for it because like we see all the party of like it's really really just the crew kind of going a little insane because of cabin fever and like the rats who are on vacation are just like super into it as like a floor show. <laughs> I just love that whole little subplot that Rizzo's just like, I'm making money on this venture one way or the other. <laughs> I just like how Cabin Fever peters out because the sun comes out and everyone's like, oh, yeah, I'm okay. It's like, oh, wait, no, it's fine. <laughs> I feel good. We, we are moving again. <laughs> oh, yeah, the wind starts blowing. That's it. The wind starts yeah. blowing. Yeah, oh, yeah, because the wind had died yeah. and they are just sitting there. Yeah. So eventually, a trio of brigands, I, I call them brigands, they're, they were kind of like the most not nice guys on the boat. Um, they capture and torture Gonzo and Rizzo. I mean, they try and, co- and, and torture Gonzo, but it doesn't work because Gonzo's a strange alien man and he likes it. Um, and before they take a hot poker to Rizzo, they are caught by Sam the Eagle uh, and they are thrown into the brig. Um, now, they were torturing them because they were trying to find out where the map was because there was whispers about what the intent of this voyage is because apparently they hired the crew and they didn't tell them anything about what was going on or what the mission was but everyone thought it was about treasure and they were going to torture them to find out that is pretty screwed up i mean it's like again a kid movie but just the tone of which like the hot poker and the torture device that i really wish i could have personally because that looks like it can pop every single you know yeah, right. Uh, it looks good. so comfortable. I would totally wear one of those. But even when like Sam the Eagle shows up and he walks in the room and you know the, the clueless Morgan is holding the the poker and he puts it in his hand and it's starting to smoke and stuff and it's just like wow you're actually going to use that on a Muppet? This is a kids movie. Yeah, and like you can it, and it wasn't like Tom and Jerry violence. It was like you can see he is in dire stress about how much pain he is in and trying not to reveal it because he's trying to hide the fact that they, he was torturing them. Um, yeah, some dark tones. But yeah, so Sam Eagle locks him up. Uh, and it's at this point that Kermit approaches Jim because Kermit no longer thinks that the map is safe staying with Jim. 
and asks if he could have it to keep it safe. Jim says no. Kermit orders him anyway, uh, and the, ma the map is locked away in the ship's safe, and the key is given to Sam the Eagle. You know, the funny thing is, I had this in my notes earlier, but... Um... You know, because the rich half-wit son is the financier of this entire expedition, he actually owns the rights to the contents of that chest. Since he is pretty much... Uh, That's a good point. He does, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah, he has the whole claim. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, yeah, I guess technically it, was, it would be... No well, deal was struck. He would get right. paid back. He would get paid back plus whatever the contract was for, and then everything else would go to Jim. Which was a fancy ship, so I can imagine it's like, all right. Yeah, fancy ship, big crew. Grand like, total uh, is $20,000. We found nineteen ninety nine on that voyage, so... Yeah, we didn't we didn't really hear Billy talking about numbers and, like, how much gold is there? Could we finance a boat for what is in those chests? Yeah. Or we shoot all of you with two flintlock pistols. <laughs> all of you. Just get real all close together. Real close. And they're 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 ball uh, ball bearing shots, so like uh, they might still miss. <laughs> uh, uh, one of the scenes that made me laugh too. I think this was before the um, yeah. This was just before um, the Mister Arrow going overboard thing. But um, when the the whole voyage started, and um, Tim Curry comes in with the brandy cart. And every single time he's like, "Oh, we've got to toast to a f to a, for a successful voyage." And then you know, Fozzie grabs the stuff and he starts pouring the liquor into the thing. And then just like Kermit says, "No, we're not drinking on this voyage." And then you just see Fozzie look at the glass and he throws it, like dumps the liquid over the out the window. Mm -hmm. And he's like, "No, but we've got to. It's special brandy. It's a special occasion. We've got to." And he's like, "Oh, well, if it's a special occasion, you see him pour the thing again." <laughs> and then Kermit's just like, "No, we're not drinking on this voyage. It's just there's going to be no alcohol consumption." You see Fozzie dump it out again. And these are like massive glasses that he's filling up. So, he's Long John comes in talking about how expensive and like special this stuff is and it's a full bottle and by the time he gives it back, the camera doesn't really pay attention to it or the actors do, but when he gives it back, the bottle's like empty. Fuzzy <laughs> <laughs> uh, checking out the window. He does it like three times, uh, and I just thought it was always funny seeing that because uh -huh. it's just it's like healthy portions. Like that's you don't serve brandy that much to a in a single serving. He was like filling it like it's a wine glass. <laughs> it's so good. So yeah, so Long John uh, is kind of learning a bit about everything that's going on because he's become Jim's number one friend. Has the, the 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 inkling? Oh no, he actually tells him directly because Jim is like blowing off steam that the captain took the map, uh, and kind of inadvertently tells Long John that the map is locked in the safe. So Long John tricks Sam the Eagle, Mister Arrow, uh, into going overboard, and he does it in the weirdest way possible, which is telling the tall tale of him being on a previous ship that they had to abandon, and most of the crew died because of leaky life rafts, and. Sam the Eagle being the, the astute, um, maybe OCD first mate, decides that he needs to test all the right lifeboats. I feel like this is a video game, and he just rolled a charisma check, and Long John had like a like a thirty with a plus, you know, with a plus sixty to it, because it was that's a thin story. And he's like, you know what? You're right. I'm gonna go do that. That's a good idea. Yeah. So so sam the eagle goes into the lifeboat and is jumping up and down it he's like oh no it seems safe it's like oh they seem that way but once you get them out in the open ocean rolls charisma uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's that's when you really find out and he's like oh okay cast me off then it's like really but sir what about okay. what about your keys nat 20 you're right. I, I would this would be a terrible thing if I lost them. Here you go. <laughs> oh, and my hat. Oh, yes, yes, my hat too. It's, it's like long guns just rolling twenties the whole time. Uh, so Sam goes overboard, much to the sadness of the captain. Not really so much the crew, but the captain. Uh, and now with uh, Long John having the keys to the safe, uh, he sends his his crony. Well, he brought, breaks his cronies out of the brig. Uh, and sends them to get the map. Uh, it is at this point that we start to overhear Long John's plan. Um, we kind of get this bit of misdirection where we think, oh, Long John's going to yell at them. Or, or, oh, wait, no, it's the reverse. Where Long John is kind of down there, like, 
conspiring with them and then Jim shows up and he's like, oh no, I was actually yelling at them, uh, like pretending to be the good guy. Um, but we learn about Long John's plan to uh, steal the treasure and mutiny to take over the boat. Uh, and it's just at this point that we also hear that they have spotted land. Uh, so Jim, learning this information, runs to the captain and tells the captain that Long John's a bad guy, he's got the treasure map, and he's going to host a mutiny. So in what was actually a good idea, Kermit is like, okay, so the crew like tells Long John to take the entire crew and go ashore and find provisions. And he was just going to maroon them. <laughs> <laughs> and then come back in a year and be like, all right, how you feel now? <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm just like, all right, yeah, I see it. I get this. That's a good plan. Um, but unfortunately, just as they were leaving, Long John uh, tricks Jim into helping him with his uh, crutch or cane um, and pulls him aboard, uh, hijacking Jim onto the journey as a little bit of insurance uh, so that they can't be marooned. Which, good call on the Dumble Cross. Like, like Long Long John is like S tier captaining. Oh yeah, at this point. Oh yeah, he's definitely sharp and he knows. He he's he looks like just like the in, in this world where you know how you're dressed and how you act and oh he's just a lowly cook. You would think that oh he's not that smart, but he is definitely <laughs> he's smart as paint, lad. Smart as paint. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's like um, Emperor Palpatine levels of thought on this yeah. one with the double and triple crosses. Um, so Long John and the pirate crew, uh, they make landfall. They're all setting up. And Long John, who is gen- genuinely likes Jim, like, it's not it's not all a facade. I feel like if this was a rom-com, it would have been the, like, yeah, I was just pretending to be your friend at first to get the treasure map. But, like, then I found out that we were really good friends kind of situation. <laughs> In a Leo DiCaprio, like, you know, 25-year-old sort of way. Yeah, no, I yeah. totally get that. Uh, so Long John tries to convince Jim to join his pirate crew in the best way, which is via song, um, where we get the professional pirate um, mm. song, which is a great number. And as Tim Curry says in the middle, in the, the early parts of the song, that this is his only number. So, like, make it a good one, lads. <laughs> and, com- and, and, like, it, like fourth wall breaking, like when they i think they get to the first chorus and he says just as the for, the first chorus starts it's like show them that we've been practicing lads <laughs> and, I, and i'm just like so good it's such a a great throwaway throwaway line for it um so yeah long john in song in song long john in song wow that's tough uh tries to convince jim to become a pirate with them and jim is not on board uh, he's not a fan of piracy. He doesn't like it. He is not going to be a pirate. Um, meanwhile, back on the boat, Kermit and the crew have figured out that Long John has kidnapped Jim. Uh, so now they're trying to make a plan to save Jim. So they're going to break off in the teams. Kermit, Rizzo, and Gonzo are going to go abo- uh, go ashore and try and save Jim in a little secret mission. And the other officers are going to stay on board and watch the ship. Um, the only problem is, is as we learn in the the double double cross, is that Long John has left some of his best men on board, and as soon as Kermit leaves, uh, his best men very quickly overtake Fozzie, Beaker, and um, uh, I can't remember Mr. Hun- the uh, professor's Professor name. Honeydew. Honeydew, thank you. Uh, very very quickly overtake them and capture the ship, much to the joy of Long John and the pirates ashore. Bunsen Honeydew. Bunsen, that's real, Professor yeah. Bunsen. Yeah, they do the like the two cannon thing to let them know. So like they mm-hmm. hear the first shot and they're like, "Ah, oh, we're being under attack." And he's nah. If you hear one more shot, lads, it means that we have successfully taken the ship. And he does the like listening in with his ear thing, and you hear that <laughs> second shot go, and they start to cheer out because they know they are now successful. And we got that great line. I can't remember who exactly says it on the ship. He's like, oh, if only we loaded our weapons. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, good, good job, Fozzie. You, you've tried to prevent it and you didn't load your weapons. Okay. Uh, so when Con- Kermit, Gonzo, and Rizzo make landfall, they are essentially immediately taken hostage by an indigenous tribe of pigs. 
<laughs> which is the great like they get there and it's dark and they they put out their lantern and then all all you can see is their eyes and then you just get the more eyes and more eyes and like which is like the classic cartoon like monsters in the dark thing but it's pulled off really well in yeah this. you can see the eyes are still glowing when the lights turn on but it's a really very well done shot because you can't tell at first it goes dark but you still see the eyes and then more show up and then the lights come on and they're all there it was so good so good yeah which i i mean it's hard to tell like it's probably they have probably like some backlit just eyes on sticks on, on like dowels and then they cut before the like i mean i'm not sure but no, like, i think that was the, I, the, I think, think the, all, well you can tell the lights the eyes are lit Oh, are they? They're yeah. like the puppets themselves are. It lit. probably just took a couple takes to make sure all the puppets were looking at the camera properly. But um, mm-hmm. no, that was all because Gonzo's eyes are the biggest, and you can see that his mm-hmm. are actually lit. Uh, I'll have to watch that again because, like, I saw it. And I'm like, oh, it's such a good, a good translation of that like classic cartoon, like gag mm-hmm. that they do. Yeah, and I was like, oh, it's cool to see it with like doing some practical stuff, like imagine that like wasn't the easiest to get the lighting right for i liked uh, um the band what is their band called electric like animal Man. oh yeah they, electric get, Man. they get shoehorned into just like one shot <laughs> like they cut to the <laughs> oh, island. that's right yeah they're like are in the, the rocks are for we the, the pirate professional side, pirates are not don't get involved in politics man <laughs> <laughs> so good yeah i i'm they're like in the rocks and i'm like what is electric man? i'm just doing <laughs> children i was like nah just play the gig man play the gig it's like all right for you, sure you do you do you dr teeth <laughs> which by the way shout out to that show the electric mayhem on disney plus watch it if you haven't yeah, already they, they buried that show in disney it, plus. it is amazing and is one of the best shows i've watched in the last couple of years that front to back the entire season we binged it in like not even like two days it was an awesome awesome show and even though they're not my favorite muppet crew within the entire cast um they it was a fan it, it, fantastic and just the way that it was written and it was relevant and it was so good people need to watch it i forgot well, it was that cool was also thing. just seeing an adjacent muppet storyline what like it's not or what dean i forgot that was even a show yeah honestly yeah, and it, it's just weird that it, it came out and it wasn't even on the front page of Disney Plus when it came yeah, out. Yeah, they don't care about Muppets. It's sad. So weird. I mean, it's not Marvel, so... Um, so yeah, so they get captured by the indigenous tribe of pigs, uh, who we find is led by Miss Piggy in like another great gag. Boom, shaka laka with... boom, shaka laka laka boom, shaka laka laka Yeah, who all the pigs who have basically revere her as a god... Um, and have called her Boom Shakalaka. Boom Shakalaka. Boom Shakalaka. <laughs> and they like they get into like this chant that starts Boom Shakalaka, and then very slowly just degenerates into Boom Shakalaka. Boom shakalaka. Boom shakalaka. <laughs> Elephant coming up. I mean, wouldn't you rever- revere her as a god? I mean, I'm um, maybe. I mean, uh, I'm trying to think of the Muppets. There's actually not many female Muppets. Um. But yeah, in that great little boom shakalaka scene, uh, it's revealed that Miss Piggy is now the leader of the indigenous pig tribe. Uh, and Miss Piggy, who is actually, we find out, the ex fiance of Kermit. Um, she, Kermit the Frog, had left her at the altar to go and pursue his life at sea. Um, and through a series of suitors, uh, ended up at one point dating Captain Flint. Uh, and Captain Flint had marooned her on this island. Which, man, that's messed up. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to see you anymore. Here, you can live on this island. There, there you go. One of the other Wait. pigs. What's that, Dean? Who was Flint to Long John Silver? Flint was the captain. And I think uh, Long John either was the cook or was also another cabin boy. Or was... Because I know he's in the the thing in the opening. Or is that just not supposed to be Long John Silver? Uh, it is see. supposed to be Long John Silver. Sorry, I didn't mean the train wreck. I just like yeah. I think it, it, I think I he just... says that they're his old crew. Okay. So he was just on the crew in the wiki for this. I... It says one-legged cook aboard the Hispaniola. Silver's the secret leader of the pirates. He's a deceitful man and greedy, but also charismatic. And it does not mention he is kind toward Jim and appears genuinely fond of him. Silver was based in part on Stevenson's friend and mentor William Ernest Henley. 
but it hmm. does not mention. I'm trying to remember. History. Well, because Flint kills his crew. He does. Right. He so kills it can't everybody. Be his crew. Yeah. Unless he killed everyone that went ashore. Oh, Long John Silver was once a quartermaster on the ship of Captain Flint. Oh, okay. There we go. But Silver so knows he where he buried his treasure. I don't know. Anyway. It sounds like it, at least. I, that just like made me wonder. I was like, wait a minute. Like, what was his... Did he just want treasure, or was he involved in like where the treasure was put at one point? I, fr- I forget what it movie just... it was, but there was like... Oh, I think it was like Pirates. It's like, how is this story coming out if everyone was supposed to have been dead when it happened? <laughs> yeah. So how is this story there? Like, shouldn't you have died? And... It's just like, all right, well, moving on. <laughs> Everyone who's gone there has died. It's like, then how do we know about it? Yeah. <laughs> like, if Flint yeah. killed everybody in his crew, shouldn't you be dead? <laughs> how do we know there was a treasure at all? Um, so Long John's crew go on the, the search uh, for Flint's treasure now that there is no threat because they have the boat. Uh, they've captured all of the, the officers. Um, but they find that when they get there, it has already been dug up. Uh, and spoiler alert, it was dug up by Miss Piggy because she was there on the island with Flint when he buried it. Um, so finding out that the, the pirates have... Uh, so, uh, so finding out that Miss Piggy and the tribe had already dug up the treasure uh, and kept it in their little like hovel place, um, the pirates scare off the tribe using their black powder weapons. Uh, and set up a harrowing death trap for Kermit and Piggy. Apparently, um, Spam sued the Muppet Company for Spam, mm. but the judge threw out the case saying that Spam should be happy to be associated with something that's actually considered a real pig or made of real pig. I just can't believe that they would sue over that. That seems so silly. Yeah, people sue for less. I mean, it's just like a silly joke, and Spam's like, no, we don't want to be talked about. It's like, yeah. So, in the confusion of the pirates running out and, like, having this little battle, uh, Rizzo, Gonzo, and Jim are able to sneak away and they head for the ship, preying on the pirates' superstition to scare them off. In this which we see the return of uh, Mr. Arrow. <laughs> so, like, it's been hinted at a lot that, like, the pirates are crazy superstitious uh, and get, like, terrified about, like, little things. Um, so, we get this, this little scene where Mr. Arrow returns on the rowboat. And, like, gets to the island. And he's like, yes, don't worry, boys. This one is safe. <laughs> <laughs> like, three weeks later. After we uh, talked about it earlier, I looked it up, and Mr. Arrow was drunk, and he did fall overboard on that stormy night. Oh, really? really? Yeah. <laughs> so it was a nice that uh, they brought him back for this. The part is small, and it's the, you know, the deuce ex machina to explain how they get back on the boat without having to swim. So, I mean, it works, yeah. but... Yeah, so they're able to get back using Mr. Arrow's boat, and they use the fact that no one else knows Mr. Arrow is alive to dress him up as a ghost to scare the pirates off, who are very superstitious and are terrified by Mr. Arrow covered in seaweed and a little bit of, like, white makeup to make him look kind of ghostly. (laughs) They killed dead Tom. (laughs) (laughs) He was always dead. That's why they called him dead Tom. And he just drops the body. Oh. (laughs) Yeah. He's like, oh. (laughs) It's like you you were just you were weakening at Bernie's it so hard he believed it. Uh, So Jim and the now freed crew uh, take back the Hispaniola and rescue Kermit and Piggy, who have now reconciled in their little song hanging over a cliff, uh, as they uh, plummet off the side of a cliff. (laughs) That sudden Um, plummet is hilarious to me. It's like the song ends and it just like the rope snaps and she's like ah. She's just like <laughs> screaming bloody murder. Like legitimate like screams. Yeah. Like, oh wow, that's good. And like just like the the meanest trap. Like we're gonna hang you over a cliff with a rope and have like a tea light <laughs> just at the rope. And it'll eventually cut through. Who knows when? Um but yeah, they reconcile and they, they plummet from the cliffside, um, but are narrowly narrowly rescued. Um, not by the net that the crew puts out, but by the um Oh, I can't Waldorf think of their names. Oh, thank you. Sattler and Mord- Waldorf. Sattler and Waldorf. Yep. Yep. Who are the um, the the heads of the boat. I, I know there's a proper name for that, but I'm spacing yeah, on it. Yeah, not Masthead, right? Or is it Masthead? No. I think so, maybe. Uh, it's a, it's an effigy thing that's like usually it's, like a it's mermaid. It's usually a mermaid, or, right. Yeah. Yeah. 
and it's under um, like the so front mast. At least we're not in the kind audience. Of their, their bit part. Oh. Yeah, it was a joke at the beginning, and then this. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh wait they they had a joke earlier about when they get to the island. It's like it's like retirement facilities, something else, and they're both like bikinis. bikinis. <laughs> oh, that's right. I forgot they had another joke. <laughs> Risque. Uh, so now that the crew is all back together, they launch a final assault against the, against the pirates with the help of Piggy's followers. And they uh, defeat the pirates on shore in a giant old school swashbuckling battle scene uh, and successfully take the pirates prisoner. Now this whole action sequence, I thought was great. It was. Like we get, we get, we get a whole duel between um, Kermit and Tim Curry <laughs> where we see that like Kermit the Frog is like this swashbuckling uh, swashbuckling master um but has sweaty hands so he ends up losing his sword but does really quite well and like i don't know i i I loved this battle scene like growing up i always thought about it really fondly and occasionally i would mix it up in my head with the final battle scene of hook yes i can see that (laughs) you can cut them together and you would just think it's one even bigger battle scene (laughs) i was like oh there's muppets too oh and there's this other guy who's kind of looks like hook i don't know yeah um so with the pirates successfully taken prisoner the crew sets sail with the treasure in tow back to london to have the pirates punished um but long john discovers that he still has sam the eagle's keys which is a huge oversight Massive. like in every it's just like oh he had the keys oh yeah nobody searched anybody all right that's fine uh so he makes his escape from the ship in the middle of the night uh except that he's found out by jim who is on the night watch uh and we have this little touching scene because Jim is like, he has his whistle and he's like, he's going to call for the captain and, and get Long John. Uh, and Long John pulls his pistol and he's like, don't do it, boy, I'll shoot you. And then Long John do it, you won't. ends up not. <laughs> yeah, do it, you won't. And he can't bring himself to do it because he really, truly cares for Jim. Uh, almost like like a, an uncle family relationship, um, which was a nice little I touch. Did, that, I like, did like the relationship, in- even though it was clear that, you know, he was the bad guy. Um, all the wholesome yeah. moments that they did have together, you can tell Jim never had that in his life. And he was looking yeah. up to him like almost like uh, Harry and Sirius Black and that kind of relationship. Mm-hmm. So uh, so it was good to see that that was like a, a real honest relationship. Like there, there was something there. So Long John admits that he, he truly cared for Jim and can't bring himself to shoot him. And Jim allows Long John to escape. Uh, except that only later we discover that the boat Long John took was faulty as Sam the Eagle found. Uh, and at the, like, I can't remember if it's a post credit scene or not. Um, we see Long John trying to bail, bail his, uh, his rowboat pretty unsuccessfully, but luckily he's still pretty close to the island. So I think the assumption is that he swims ashore after the treasure sinks to the bottom of the ocean where he will be marooned with the pigs. And become and their king. that is where we end our tale. No, it doesn't. Then, then we see the credits roll. <laughs> and then as the sh- as the, we see all like the little rats that are like scuba diving and you see them bringing the sunken chest up back to the surface. That's right. The, the, the subplot of the tourist rats who are from the 20th century, but because oh, yeah, they, have, they scuba. have scuba gear. <laughs> yeah, they have scuba gear and they have those underwater jet ski things, <laughs> but are on a fanciful pirate ship. Uh, it was a, in one of the best subplots ever. It was a ruse the entire time. Yeah, it is actually just the ride at Disney. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do what do we think? Who would like to go first? On on, I know Dean. This is a first watch from you, and you kind of gave some opinions already. And I don't have anything else to say about it. <laughs> um, that was are my thoughts. No, yeah, like the Muppets. I mean, like I said, it's. They're family friendly, but they they do have an edge to them at times. Um, they're just like a staple of American culture, and just one of those things. I'm glad has they're still around. I I, I mean their movie their recent movie came out. I don't know. It was been ten years ago, something like that. Yeah, unless it there might was, have been a while. Ago. I remember when they movie. they they like did their comeback and they had two movies. Um. I know. I thought they were pretty good. I, I didn't watch the Office show, but it was just it was a bad point in my life. Where it wasn't. I, it was. It wasn't good. It wasn't. Yeah, because I mean, I no. remember it coming out, but just, I mean, it wasn't like I was going through a dark time in my life. But it was just it was a time where I wasn't watching cable TV. This was like the rise of Netflix and, 
you know, it was mm-hmm. a lot. Out, it was like my early twenties kind of thing, and I'm just, I'm not watching TV. I'm going out and doing early twenties stuff. But um, you know, the Muppet uh, Monster uh, uh, Haunted Mansion, I didn't really care for it. It wasn't bad, but just not what I was wanting at that time. Mm-hmm. And then the Electric Mayhem thing was fantastic. But yeah, there really hasn't been much else. You gotta besides, check like, that Electric Mayhem out. It's worth it. It but, breaks um, the fourth wall enough that it, that's that's the part where it really shines when they break the fourth wall because they know how to do it well. I guess, yeah, Not to. I didn't want to get off on too much of a tangent, but my point being, they'll always be part of the zeitgeist even if they don't have a centralized yeah. show they're doing. They're going to, they'll, they'll be, they'll pop up, I think, throughout yeah, they're always for the rest of our lives. With like, with like a reel or something that'll come out and I'll be like, oh yeah, the Muppets are doing a thing, I guess. <laughs> well, even, point I being, mean, yeah. I I am not in that zeitgeist whatsoever, but like, is Sesame Street still relevant as much as it was like when we were? Kids? Oh yeah, yeah, it's for still, sure, it's still killing yeah. it. Because yep. I mean, I never hear about it anymore, and it's always like Bluey or Frozen or like Peppa Pig or whatever new thing that you know Doc McStuffins. But I never really hear Sesame Street being one of the big things that are, like when Elmo went viral and going on like talk shows and stuff. Like, I felt that was more for the adults than it was for the kids. So. Mm. I think I think Sesame Street has a very specific age range. Yeah. And like my nieces were into it for like a year and they hit it hard yeah. and then they were done. Uh, okay. Well this So like I think it's like a real specific age range. This year is its fifty fifth season, so yeah, it's still going on. Wow. You can watch it on Hulu. Um and PBS, obviously. But like my point being like they're lovable characters. Um, I did. I did enjoy the movie overall. I don't have a strong love for it. I guess you could say. I'm trying to think like if I've seen any Muppet movies start to finish, or, like the classic <laughs> ones. Um, I always remember the show more so. You know, watching mm-hmm. reruns of the TV show. Um, I want to say I have seen Christmas Carol, but I, I couldn't really tell you if I have or not. At least as far like start to finish. But um. Yeah, I liked it. It's it's definitely a fun movie. It's what you expect from the Muppets. Um, enjoyable. I'll probably show Phoebe, my daughter, one day. I thought it was alright. Nick, um, <laughs> say so what about you? You had some fondness for this one. Oh yeah, no, this is this is a childhood favorite, and I forgot how much I enjoyed this because, I guess you know, as I grew up, it was it really was it was this Star Wars trilogy because they played all three of them equally and um jurassic park and if it wasn't any of those you know i was watching um most of the other muppet stuff that i have on uh vhs but the treasure island one was my absolute favorite of all the muppet stuff that i had and then i think like 99 hit and that's when like star wars really pulled ahead because that's when episode one came out and i was just getting older and then just i kind of watched it less and less and then watching it again as an adult it's just i haven't actually sat and watched it and like sat and watched it in a long time i remember watching it a few years back but just like as background because the song i like the songs that a lot of them are catchy mm. but i forget how much i really enjoyed this movie i i love it and tim curry uh like they the, they always say like you know you could judge a person a lot by you know what's the tim curry movie that you think of like the first one like that affects you the most or like that what's your tim curry movie if you're gonna name one of them a lot of people mm-hmm. like say clue rocky or picture show this one's mine so it's always been uh my favorite of his and um of all the things that he's done this is by far my absolute favorite he uh he he was actually quoted in saying that this was his favorite role he ever took i could tell yeah the whole the whole movie he absolutely is having the time of his life yeah, he he said that he uh, he said in an interview that they asked him to do it and he didn't even think about it. He was like, "Yes, of course." He's like, because he was saying that he knew that this role was going to be so much fun to do. Yeah. Um, they actually gave him at the end of filming a Muppet likeness of himself as Long John Silver. That's amazing in costume. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, I, they have an interview with him where he has it there with him, and like. I don't know who it is, but like someone is puppeteering it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to look that up. I, I think I've seen the picture once, but I forgot about it. And uh, yeah, it's really that's it, awesome. It's like it's like a fun thing that the studio like he must have just had a blast. And I mean, 
I think the movie did pretty well. I, I don't actually know the numbers on it, but of all companies to work for a lot of people especially in my industry because i'm in tech you know they would go for like google amazon like the big 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 stuff you know microsoft and and um apple like honestly of all companies that i would want to work for that are super massive it would have to be like the jim crunch you know the jim henson studio it it would have to be them Mm because every project they do you could tell that they're having the time of their lives and they're not in it for the money so to speak and every single time they do a big movie or um, for somebody else or when they finally have the time to do their own thing, they're focusing on the content much less than just how can we do this the cheapest way possible. And it really shows that they have the heart. And this movie is a perfect example of just the heart is there and two cooks can make the same exact meal. But the chef that's enjoying doing what he does, it's always going to taste better. And this is a delicious meal right here. Yeah, and actually, um, this this actually made in domestic uh, made thirty four million dollars, so uh, not bad in nineteen ninety six. My Tim Curry movie is Scary Movie Two. He's in Scary <laughs> Movie Two. <2? laughs> I'm just kidding. Yes, but he is in that oh. movie. No, he is in that movie, but it's not my Tim Curry movie. <laughs> <laughs> I was more surprised about he was in Scary Movie Two than <laughs> that being your pick. I need to rewatch that one again. I've only seen the I, I saw the first one a thousand times only because that was one of my first DVDs. And then back mm. then when it came out, it's like, well, what are we gonna watch? Well, we have we have scary movie, so let's watch that because this was before like Blockbuster would even have them. So, so then that makes me wonder, Dean, who is your or what is your Tim Curry movie? Um, I, I mean, I guess it's I guess it's Rocky Horror. Yeah, is it? Yeah, pretty much. Hmm. He scared the shit out of me in cool. Legend, but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Legend. He great. looks the coolest in Legend, <laughs> but I think of him as Frankenfurter. Yeah, it's hard to shake that one. Hmm. Um, I mean, this one for me, I I just break this one out and watch it occasionally in general. So like, in terms of how well do I think it holds up, it's like I don't know, well enough to watch it like once every six months. Sounds right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, I'm just, I'm just a Muppet diehard. Um, so like for me, I like the Muppets always like hits a certain spot in like my humor style and like even the songs and, um, you know, Muppet, Muppet Christmas Carol is a annual just Christmas watch. Like it's just always on the list of the Christmas movies we're going to watch. Um, and that one's also just a total blast. Um, the amount of jokes, that I pull from the Muppets and use in everyday life, like the classic Timmy, Tim, Timmy, Tim, 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 Timmy. Um, like the, these movies, I, I'm pretty sure the movies and the show really kind of developed my comedy sense. Um, and that sort of mix of, you know, lighthearted comedy with like not adult themes, but like more grown up, like acting and stories. Like, it's funny. I think about the Muppet show and, The Muppet Show had this great blend of, like, silly, zany skits, but then also there's, like, a real actor who's our guest this week, and they do real actor stuff. Like, I I own a couple of the seasons of The Muppets on DVD, and, like, just thinking about, like, oh, they had um, Sylvester Stallone when he was doing Rocky, and he was on his tour promoting Rocky. He was on The Muppet Show. Like, that was just one of the things that you did uh, at that point in time. Is that, like, you would just go on The Muppet Show to promote whatever you were doing. Which is just, like, mind-boggling at that time. That, like, the Johnny Carson show and The Muppets were things that you would do. (laughs) They should bring that back. I know. I loved the the original style and, like, how they had the framing device for it. Which, I love framing devices. I never watched Um, the original one, but I watched Muppets Tonight. Which is just the 90s version of the Muppet mm. show and I mean I watch SNL now and some episodes are on fire it hits the jokes are amazing the guests are great but there are plenty of ones that are also like they're just not that great you know like last mm-hmm. this past one with um Dua Lipa as the the host and singer I just I mean it wasn't bad but I didn't really care for that one the one with Ryan Gosling was gold I love that one episode but I can only imagine like you know Ryan Gosling's on a or, it's on like a hot streak right now, but then can you imagine um, him on the Muppets instead? Like, holy shit, that's gonna be amazing. Yeah, and that's like that's just the style of of how the Muppet Show ran. Like, I remember, 
I can't think of his name, but the lead singer from Alice in Chains was like on an episode of The Muppets and was like, <laughs> like, and he was the musical guest. Stand, and with stand. their musical guests, they built a skit around them. So like, it's a whole thing. And like, they had, they had serious people. Like, I mean, they had, I remember one of my favorite episodes, uh, the, the special guest was Harry Belafonte. Yep. And it was the first time he sang the Banana Boat song on television was on The Muppet Show. Yep. And it's just like super cool things like that. Like it is like the Muppet Show was just Saturday Night Live with Muppets. Yeah, it really was. And it, I think the content is there. I really wish they would bring it back. Yeah, I mean, I I think I mean who knows with younger generations if those kinds of things would hit. Hard to say, but that is that is my my Muppet soapbox that I <laughs> I stand on. I will always shout the praise of the Muppets wherever I can. As I shout their praise. So that about wraps it up for us. We can't thank you enough for coming along to revisit Muppet Treasure Island. If you like what you've heard, please drop a review or rating and subscribe to us on Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts to help us out. I know everyone always says this, but likes and subscribing really does help the channel out quite a lot. Uh, We also have social media, but uh, I do admit it, we aren't always very good at pushing ads and keeping us in the forefront of your thoughts. Uh, You're busy. We're busy. Sometimes we're busy watching the Muppets. Um, we get it. You can still find us on Instagram at Screen Refresh and smash the like and subscribe button on YouTube uh, at at the Screen Refresh Network. Uh, you can also shoot us an email at screenrefresh at gmail dot com, uh, or you can join us on our Discord. So for Dean and Nick, uh, this is David, and take care of yourself. And you can catch us next on Rule of Thirds, airing every third Monday of the month. Uh, Also, you can hear us on our sister podcast, Don't Open This Podcast, every second and fourth Monday of the month. Uh, You be you be good out there and don't don't you don't go pirating. Smartest paint less, smartest paint. (laughs) I hate your life. Jimmy, 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 Jimmy.